So this year, my presentation is going to be a bit different. I'm not going to talk about food so much as I did last year. I'm going to share with you the relationship that we know of between the symptoms that are related to histamine intolerance and the DIO enzyme polymorphisms and how at a clinical level we can go from suspicion to a correct diagnosis as accurate as possible. So again, we're trying to see how to go from suspicion to the evidence. We'll see how to interpret a genetic test that is positive in clinical practice. And I'll also share with you some preliminary results of two clinical studies, an observational study and an intervention study that we are carrying out at the research group of University of Barcelona. And well, we have some preliminary results to share with you. As healthcare providers, I guess we're all healthcare providers, healthcare professionals. Well, when we have a patient who comes with different symptoms and functional symptoms that are quite diverse, and uh, not apparently related, well, we can think about the paradigm of DAO. My colleague, Dr. Sanchez, shared with you this morning a study which was published in 2019, and they assessed symptoms and combination of symptoms that were related to histamine intolerance. And they saw that in order to reach a correct diagnosis of this intolerance, at least there had to be two present symptoms, two to three symptoms. And we will see later on what kind of systems in the body they affect. And there had to be a reduction of the DAO activity. And now we'll see what kind of analysis we're using, we were using in the past and what we're using today. And we saw whether these patients were improving the symptomatology when following a low histamine diet. And then this would um, confirm the correct diagnosis of uh, histamine intolerance. So the symptoms that we were referring to, and we still refer to those nowadays, and maybe this table could be even enlarged today thanks to the studies which are being published. So we see that in clinical practice, we find mostly patients refer symptoms related to the gastrointestinal tract and to the nervous system. These are the main symptoms for them. There's also patients who refer symptoms from the respiratory apparatus, the circulatory system, or the skin. Dr. Sam Mauro was commenting as well that we may include some symptoms from the locomotor system, like fibromyalgia, for example. But what we see in the protocol of histamine intolerance and uh, DIO deficiency, we see that at least two symptoms have to be present. We will see that whenever there are more than two symptoms effective, if these two symptoms affect more than one system, then the correct diagnosis becomes more evident. And now I'm going to show some seconds of a video that is part of an awareness raising campaign for DAO deficit. And we like to show this video to our patients. We see this DAO, it's just like jellyfish. This oxidates the histamine that comes to the small intestine. Even though DAO would be more, well, it would be smaller and it would be found in the villi. And some molecules of histamine go to the blood flow, they accumulate in the plasma, and they go to different histamine receptors and provoke different symptomatologies. 
Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because so far or up till 2019, one of the parameters that was used, there was the activity of DIO in plasma. But we see that in clinical practice, we may find many cases where DIO was apparently normal or very close to the threshold and uh, to the, let's say, the normal levels. But patients kept improving when submitted to a treatment. So in the last three to four years, there's been this new technique, this new way to diagnose this DIO deficiency, even though, of course, we still need much more research if we want to move forward in science and if we want to see what kind of variants are the most correct one to reach a diagnosis. But up till now, up till today, my colleagues were saying today, that we have four variants, four variants which are directly related to DIO deficiency. And these are the four variants that we have used in our different studies that I'm going to refer to now. But what do we do in clinical practice? Once we get a diagnosis or a positive test, well, what does it mean to have a positive? test for one or more variants related to DIO deficiency. As doctors or nutritionists or pharmacologists, we need to be able to interpret this test. And any genetic test has to be related to symptoms. It may sound silly, it does sound quite obvious, but very often there are even some relatives of patients who do not show symptoms, but they could have a positive genetic analysis because there's a, a heritage of these variants. But if there's no clinic, clinical symptoms, well then, no attention must be paid to the test. I mean, as long as there are no symptoms, but if, whenever there are symptoms and this is uh, what happens more often, you know, when a patient is requesting this test, well, then we need to provide a treatment. So whenever there's a patient with a positive genetic test for one or more variants, but with one variant is already enough. I mean, whenever there's a one variable um, altered with heterozygosis or homozygosis and presenting symptomatology, this is already enough to diagnose a DAO primary deficiency. Well, when this person improves with the dietary treatment that is proposed, and we've heard uh, the previous presentations about that, well then, we can confirm the diagnosis. You know, if the patient, after some weeks of following the treatment, uh, the patient does not see any kind of improvement, well then, we have to keep looking for another factor that may relate to the presence of the symptoms. But of course, whenever there's an improvement, you know, you normally see that after three to four weeks, or sometimes even before, you can, see this improvement and this uh, helps us confirm the diagnosis of the AO deficiency of a genetic origin. I'm going to present this study, which is an observational study with a sample of 150 patients. Sorry, 150 participants, 100 and them of them are patients with uh, histamine intolerance symptoms. from the Clinical Institute of DIO Deficiency. And then the other 50 participants are healthy individuals from the control group, and they've been recruited from the nutrition campus of the University of Barcelona. 99% of the individuals reported more than three symptoms. And this 
would be very much related to what was published in 2019. Here we can see the table of symptoms that we collected from all the patients with symptoms, this group of 100 people. So the distribution, so we see it's the circulatory system, gastrointestinal, locomotor system, nervous system, respiratory, and skin. Most of these recruited patients presented gastrointestinal symptoms and secondly with the same percentage we have patients presenting headache, migraine, fibromyalgia, fatigue, muscle pain without a clear diagnosis of fibromyalgia. In total, there was an average of eight symptoms per patient. Eight symptoms, um, if we take into account that initial frame published by Oriol Comas. We're not talking here about organic categories, we're talking here about uh, over 15 symptoms in total. So at least the number of symptoms per patient was an average of eight. Now, if we talk about systems, we're talking about uh, three or more systems affected as an average. And now we move to a different slide, which shows in this group of patients, the group of um, patients and the group of controls, we have analyzed uh, the genetic variants. And this is one of the most important points in the study. Right now, we can only share with you the uh, results from the patient group. We're still analyzing the control group, but the prevalence here is very high. 79% of uh, alterations of genetic variants in the patient group. And the distribution is between one, two, three, or four altered variants. So we see that the distribution is quite homogeneous. These patients show mostly one or two altered variants, but I would like to say that 18% of the patients have the four variants that are, that are altered. And now we're still pending to see what happens with the control group, but it's quite relevant that 79% of those patients have more than one altered variant. And here we have the different variants. And I'd like to stress that we have found no direct relationship between the variant and the symptoms related previously. And we couldn't conclude either whether having more than one variant would lead to a more severity in the symptoms. The most common variant, even though it's not significantly higher than the others, is the third one, the one that ends in 93. And we still need to to check whether there's a relationship between this and the control group. But here we have 19% of cases of homozygosis in the fourth variant, whereas in the three previous variants, there's only 10%. For instance, the second one, which is 1%, or the third one, which is 4%, first one which is 12%. It will be interesting to see the results from the control group. And now I'm going to show you data from the second study 
even though the n number was a little bit lower. But it's very interesting because this is the first time where we have an intervention study with two groups and we've been working with fungi. And so we have in group one, 16 low, low histamine diet patients with uh, uh, pig DAO enzyme. And the second group received um, a low histamine diet with a pig um, DAO enzyme plus supplementation with a fung, fungi, fungus called a Leo. And we wanted really to analyze many different things in this study. It's very interesting. And right now we're just collecting the data and uh, Last year, last week, we included the data of the last patient, and now we will be able to perform the statistical analysis. All these 33 patients were recruited at the Clinical Institute of DIO Deficiency. And for three months, different parameters were studied. First of all, the DIO activity in plasma, histamine in plasma and urine, parameters of inflammation and intestinal uh, permeability like carbopectin. And in the baseline visit, the four genetic variants were analyzed. And then for those three months of follow-up, the symptoms reported by patients were analyzed. Now we can share what we've seen so far. We can see a prevalence in terms of uh, the percentage of altered genetic variants, and we see that it looks very much like the first group of patients from the other study. We see this 79% again. And the distribution is quite similar as well to the one in the other study. Even though here we see a clear majority of patients with two altered variants. You have three minutes. Thank you very much, Maria. These are preliminary results. And of course, well, we cannot um, advance much, much more, but I wanted to share with you the evolution of this parameter which is so much related to, um, to permeability. Here we're talking about zonulin, and we analyzed this at the beginning of the treatment and at the end of the treatment. Now, in statistical terms, we cannot say much yet, but if you see in the second graph, you can observe that in the group that received a, a low histamine diet plus DIO plus um, the Myco Leo, well, there's an improvement when it comes to zonulin. So we could think that patients with DIO uh, deficit, they could benefit if they have an increased permeability that could lead to the entry of histamine in the blood flow. Well, they could benefit from this treatment of Myco Leo plus a DIO enzyme. And I would like to say that one of the symptoms that has been assessed and collected in this study, well, we see that 63% of the participants presented headache and migraine. And we could conduct a, him, a impact test at the beginning and at the end. And uh, we observed zonulin and we see that there's an improvement after the treatment when it comes to pain, intensity, and the number of episodes. 